tomorrow at 9 p.m. Why should you care about what's happening in economies around the world? Because these days we're all part of one global economy. And what happens over there is going to hit you right here. Marketplace shows you how, but in our own way. 24% of those polled said he should be reappointed. 50% said, who's Alan Greenspan? <laughs> Marketplace. Weeknights at 6.30 on WNYC AM 820. So hot, so hot, so hot, so what, so hot, so what, so hot, so hot. They made a mistake. I got more than I usually take. I got food stamps, food stamps. I got so many stamps in the mail. I thought maybe I should put them on sale. How lucky I am. I got food stamps, hot damn. I made up my mind to be decent and kind to let my upright character shine. I sent 10,000 food stamps back to the president and his beautiful wife. And I can't pay the rent, but I sent 10,000 food stamps back to the president and his beautiful wife. How lucky I am. I got food stamps. Hot damn. They made a mistake for Christ's sake, and I gave it away to the president. I thought that was legal. I thought that was kind, and I can't pay the rent, but I sent 10,000 food stamps back, back, back to the president. So hot, so hot, so hot, so what, so hot, so what, so hot, so hot. Trucks cruising down the avenue carrying nuclear garbage right next to you, and it's legal. It's radioaction riding like a regal load of jewels past the bars, this cruel schoolhouse, and the church. And if the trucks wipe out or crash or even lurch around the corner, we will just be goners. And it's legal. It's radioaction riding regal through the skittery city street. And don't be jittery because it's legal. Radioaction riding the roads, Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue. C Avenue, D Avenue of the Americas. So hot, so hot, so hot, so what? Funding for this series was made possible by a grant from the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry Incorporated. <laughs> broadcast of Firing Line is underwritten by Mitsui Fidosan, New York, a developer and owner of commercial property dedicated to bringing together the best of New York. This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with SICA. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, and the Friends of Firing Line. Uh, the issue before the House is the rising rate of uh, Ill illegitimate children. Their incidence has almost tripled among whites in the last 30 years, rising to 17 percent, and among blacks it has risen to 62 percent. Uh, most people know intuitively that the rise in single parent household is the greatest single inducement to drugs, to crime, to poverty, and to illiteracy. But the question is, uh, but the question is being faced, interestingly enough, not at a single level, i.e. what can be done about it, but also at a second level, should we in fact attempt to do anything uh, about it? The latter position is taken by those who believe that emphasis on marriage is a reactionary retrograde movement designed to subordinate the mother socially and economically. To dis discuss the question, we have uh, here David Blankenhorn, who is the president of the Institute for American Values in New York City. He and Barbara Whitehead have jointly published several uh, articles, and Ms. Whitehead is the author of the article featured in the current Atlantic monthly runaway bestseller called Dan Quayle Was 
right, i.e. about Murphy Brown. Mr. Blankhorn is a Virginian. Uh, at Harvard, he graduated with honors, going on to the University of Warwick in England to get a graduate degree. The organization he heads up is devoted to research, publication, and public education on issues of family policy. I'd like to begin by asking Mr. Blankenhorn, uh, is it uh, assumed or anticipated that unmarried, by unmarried mothers, what special difficulties they will face in raising their children, or are these all uh, adventitious? It, it, it used to be assumed, of course, that uh, raising a child alone presented all kinds of problems um, for the child and for the mother. That's shifted quite a bit in the last 20 years, and now I'd say, especially actually among people other than the, than the single parents themselves, in, in the society as a whole, there's increasingly um, a point of view that says, well, it's okay. I mean, do, do, do children need fathers? And the answer used to be, yes, they need them. And now it's not necessarily, it seems to be. The <laughs> well, what, I, what I have especially in mind uh, to ask you about is the notion in general circulation that um, uh, many teenage uh, girls become uh, mothers because they calculate that there's an economic benefit <coughs> in doing so, separate households, uh, welfare, and so on and so forth. Is, is that, um, uh, is that uh, uh, a position that, you c that is documentable, or is that simply an intuition? It's mostly an intuition. It's if if it accounts for much of the problem, it only accounts for a small fraction of the problem. <coughs> that is, um, the uh, economic advantages or the economic inducements of for single parenthood is mostly uh, welfare, mm -hmm. and I think it can be fairly said by the people who've studied this the hardest that it doesn't. Um, encourage it, but it does permit it. That is, uh, uh, for someone who's uh, looking at her options in life, if the options uh, aren't very good to begin with, and uh, uh, sh should I have a child, welfare permits that choice to, to be made. Now, is one of the recommendations that you or your organization make uh, touch on welfare policies toward um, unmarried mothers? Uh, well, my own view is that uh, the welfare system now is a pretty strong disincentive for marriage and a pretty strong disincentive for responsible fatherhood, <coughs> so that we should um, eliminate those disincentives. Uh, now, is, is, who, who are the principal backers of the contrary lobby? Is it just unmarried mothers, or is it uh, uh, the normal uh, conjuries of, of people. More the normal group. I mean, I interestingly, in our interviews, we found the most severe critics of the current welfare system to be the people who are on it. They'll tell you in unequivocal uh, terms <coughs> that it's a pretty terrible thing. And they'll tell you that one of the terrible things about it is that it's part of a system that uh, effectively keeps men out of family life. So, they're, so the welfare people themselves, people who receive it, are pretty critical of it. But I think there's a sense that um, it's just become a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, an encrusted way of doing things that's developed its own sort of rationale over time. And I also think, frankly, that sometimes, um, sometimes I wonder who's the real beneficiary from the welfare system. That is, sometimes I think it's the people who aren't on it who uh, buy it or are allowed to feel that they're doing something compassionate. <laughs> that is, we are the beneficiaries of a system that if we looked closely at it and asked the people who were on it, we would see that it's a pretty terrible system. Well, to, I, do, to, I do want to say one other thing, though. Yeah. I, I think this explains only a small fraction of the problem. The, the trend toward family fragmentation is society-wide, and it can't be explained simply by the welfare system or so. No, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to touch on that uh, rather heavily. But uh, let me ask you this one question before we dispose of it. Uh, to what extent are these sort of ultra-feminist pulsations uh, coming in at you that uh, really we 
have a situation now in which women finally affirm their individualism. They have a, a child if they want a child, but they don't need a husband. And uh, therefore, it, it, is, it would be, as I said, retrograde to, uh, to move in such a direction as to put pressure on the mother to be married. Well, there is a school of thought that says that um, single parenthood, single motherhood is um, a statement of independence. We can do this without men. And there's a school of thought that said if a mother has to choose between relying upon a husband and relying upon the state, that it's better to rely upon the state because they're less troublesome than mm -hmm. relying upon husbands. But that's a kind of... Um, that's a small opinion. It's lodged in the elite debate. It has almost no uh, adherence <laughs> on the ground. Um, it's, a, it's an intellectual argument that has a lot of influence, I think, in the media and so on, but it doesn't have, I would say there's it, not that not many. It's not the kind of thing the keynote speaker of the Democratic Convention would stress. <laughs> well, that, that's another question, but it's not the kind of thing that you would find if you just rounded up the first ten grandmothers that you found in Toledo or Baton Rouge. <laughs> well, uh, uh, l l let me ask you a question which is uh, uh, both uh, delicate and uh, uh, terribly important. The, uh, the, the whole notion of um, sanctions traditionally relies for their effectiveness mostly on public opinion rather than the law. I think it was... Um, no, it was Jefferson who said that uh, uh, public opinion is more important than the law because the law is merely a codification of, of public opinion. Now, uh, years ago, um, the actress who played in Casablanca, what's her name? Is it Lauren McCall? No, no, Casablanca. Ingrid Bergman. Ingrid Bergman, yeah. yeah. She, she came over and she, was, she had just had a child out of wedlock and she was scheduled to go on a on a popular uh, program, the Sullivan, pro and there were there were protests sort of from coast to coast. Now, I'm not asking you to be censorious on the point, but simply to make a social statement on the efficacy or lack of it of the judgment of one's peers. Uh, in the last uh, few months, we've had three spectacular uh, out of wedlock: uh, Burris, Warren, Beatty, Eddie. Murphy and Jack uh, Nicholson, and uh, it seems not to matter to uh, uh, anybody. Up until up until 25 years 25 years ago, you couldn't um, you couldn't enter the royal circle in Ascot if you had ever been divorced. Let alone, about which, by the way, would have been excluded an awful lot of royal relatives of the Queen. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 the uh, I guess the question I'm asking is, what is it that has happened that causes public sentiment simply to adjourn right. uh, any adverse judgment on people who have children without making the basic commitment associated with marriage? Right. Th this is the heart of the matter. And a, a good analogy, I think, is smoking, because um, it's really not true that we are becoming a more permissive society uh, across the board. We, in fact, are uh, raising our standards of expectation of private behavior in the whole area of what might be called the natural ecology. And smoking is really the best example. Um, no one smoking here two or three decades ago probably would have been quite common. So smoking is something that people do privately. We haven't outlawed it, but what we have done is stigmatize it and stigmatize it and tax it, so that um, people are made. And that, to, that works, doesn't it? People yeah. are made to feel bad if they smoke. Mm -hmm. It's seen as something that's not a good thing to do. Why? Because the society has essentially changed its mind on this issue and said, "Here is a private behavior that has social consequences. Mm -hmm. Therefore." it's a good thing to uphold certain cultural norms and social values on this issue of smoking. So we're raising our standards. But you have, you have to have a consensus on toxicity. You do. And, and uh, of course, at the beginning of the smoking debate, there were counter studies and people arguing that, in fact, smoking relaxed. But that was special interest stuff. But the, the, playful, the Playboy philosophy is absolutely articulate on this point. 
uh, namely that uh, uh, sexual intercourse is uh, exclusively for uh, for pleasure. That's right. Uh, and right. Uh, uh, I, I see nothing. Commitments are a bind. Yeah, I see nothing happening that seems to challenge that. Uh, uh, sure, in terms of Christian orthodoxy, that is challenged. But I don't see I don't see any counterpart to the anti-smoking uh, ranks mobilizing. Do you? The only glimmer I see is that there's an increasing social awareness that child well-being is declining and that the result of a rather vast social experimentation of the past three decades in family fragmentation, family diversity, has produced a now rather long-term trend of declining child well-being. And I think well, there's a general sense that that's true and that it is linked to the issue of family fragmentation. Well, that might mobilize pressures for, tri for birth control or for abortion without necessarily mobilizing pressures for licentious sex, or is it, uh, is it axiomatic that the two are related, i.e., to the extent that there is licentious sex, there is going to be more birth control, uh, more, more, more births, more intimate births? I think you're right in the sense that uh, there isn't really yet a very good way that the obvious can be stated on this point. Um, I mean, what's interesting to me about the whole family structure debate now is not so much uh, the sort of empirical evidence that, that tells us that mothers and fathers married to one another are the best way to bring up children. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, using social science to show that the earth is round. But, but what's really interesting is this other question you raise of why is it so hard, especially in our elite discourse, we don't even have a vocabulary for talking about it. it you, you, you know, you can't, you can't say anything that would make someone feel bad. You can't say something that would be considered as judgmental. The other thing you can't do um, is make what the social scientists would call a confirmed empirical generalization. Because, you know, a confirm again, to get back to the smoking analogy, here's an example of a confirmed empirical generalization. Smoking can be hazardous to your health. A sort of clinical veto of that generalization is why I know Frank next door who smoked two packs a day for 30 years, he's mm -hmm. healthy as a horse. Mm -hmm. In our debate about smoking, we don't let the example of Frank veto the confirmed empirical generalization that smoking can be hazardous to your health. In our debate about illegitimacy out of wedlock childbearing, it governs. Someone can say, well, aren't a lot of two-parent families terrible? Oh, yes, that's true. Aren't there a lot of single moms who do a great job? Well, that's true, too. So therefore, yeah. you have nothing to say. Wasn't Alexander Hamilton illegitimate? Right, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, so well, you're right, we can't, it, it's, it, the interesting question is why we've lost our vocabulary for discussing this issue, why we can't have a reasoned moral discourse about this topic without it becoming uh, politicized, uh, turned into therapeutic talk, and so on. Well, now, uh, uh, your, your institute uh, uh, permits or does not permit, encourages or does not encourage uh, value judgments of a kind that some would call censorious. For instance, uh, would you permit yourself to be the author of the statement, there should not be, uh, Ill, there, there should not be um, freelance intercourse between people who do not intend to be married? Well, uh, my own well, view... Well, that's like Calvinistic. Well, <coughs> My own view, which is uh, maybe a little bit, not quite what you're asking me, but I, <coughs> I think unwed parenthood is morally wrong. That's what I would say. Uh, well, well, now, that's, uh, a, is, is there a, that's my value judgment on th that. There's obviously a biological correlation between <laughs> intercourse and parenthood. Right. right. Uh, but uh, to the extent that that is a flexible correlation, right. uh, should, uh, should, should em empirically minded people put their money in the bank of, of uh, 
prophylactic intercourse or interdictive uh, intercourse. Uh, I, I wrote a piece a couple of days ago um, uh, in which I said, so, you know, somebody ought to form an organization called Unplanned Parenthood <laughs> and, and, and see whether or not that gets better results than Planned Parenthood. <laughs> the more money Planned Parenthood spends, the more Unplanned Parenthood one <laughs> seems to get, right? Have, 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 you, have, have you reached an empirical conclusion about the correlation between, say, early sex education and uh, uh, illegitimate uh, 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 unplanned births? The best studies I've seen suggest that, for example, in schools, uh, sex education as, as it currently is taught, condom distribution, uh, counseling of one kind and another, um, does seem to produce a net increase in what the, what we're trying to now stop. Tell me why. Is it, is it because it's, it's kind of an aphrodisiac, the whole experience? I don't know if it's an aphrodisiac. Well, I, that, I use that as a metaphor. I think... Um, <laughs> I think that what it is is this fundamental conflict between, on the one hand, the drive to um, normalize uh, ever early sexual experiences on the part of young people. It's, it's a normal, healthy thing. It's up to you based on your personal choice, consulting your own individual value system, and we are here we, the teachers, the counselors, the therapists, the healthcare workers, are here to help you get painless. realize your personal choices and philosophy in this matter and to tell you what they all are and to tell you that they're all, from a kind of moral point of view, more or less equivalent, in, except insofar as you choose one or the other. And on the other hand, uh, that approach seems to be, generally speaking, um, incompatible with um, uh, don't have sex. Don't have sex until later or until you're married. Mm -hmm. Those two things are incompatible. And uh, so it, insofar as there's a tension, we've shifted more toward, uh, I think, what I would call the sexualization of childhood. That is the <clears throat> belief that whereas heretofore we have tended to protect children from having the burden of sexual decision making, we now ask them to accept that burden themselves, in part because we're no longer as adults willing to accept it for them. And so we, we tell the child, you now decide, you are an eight or 10 or 11 year old sexual being, you decide. There's a, um, in one of the big public school systems, there's actually a bill of rights for children in the first, um, thing that they teach the children when they hand out the Bill of Rights is that um, uh, you have the right to decide uh, when you'll have sex and who you'll have it with. That's the kind of, a, you know, your tax dollars at work. Yeah. <laughs> Bill of Rights. Well, well there, 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 are, there, are two, there are two points here that we're juggling. One is empirical and the other is, um, uh, is moral and of course we don't hesitate as required to relate the two. But, uh, uh, are you, are you telling me that uh, sex education courses, even though they are theoretically designed to prevent unwilling pregnancies, in fact promote unwilling pregnancies, is it because people don't listen to the lessons that they're being told or is it simply because of the statistical uh, 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 uncertainty of the result? Well, first of all, there's a question of how many of the pregnancies are actually unwilling and how many of them are actually, you know... Do you have figures on that? No. There are, also some, there are also some examples that go counter to the point I'm making. For example, there are some schools where you have a very, very high rate of, of, of out-of-wedlock childbearing where, at least in the first few years, the introduction of... Um, counseling and uh, uh, distribution of condoms and so on has resulted... Yeah, after the first birth? Uh, no, uh, oh. period. Uh -huh. Has resulted in fewer um, pregnancies uh, and childbirths. But 
I think the weight of evidence suggests that for most schools, uh, introducing this notion, which I would call the sexualization of childhood, mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, the current way of teaching about sex and the current way of thinking about dis distributing uh, birth control and so on, uh, well, it, it, I, I think that the net result of this is more, more sex and more pregnancy. So it, I don't, I know there are people who would say that they have studies that show differently, but I think the weight of evidence is not good. Therefore, my conclusion from this is that this is not essentially a health problem. This is not essentially a legal problem. It is a cultural normative problem, and it is about um, uh, uh, finding a way, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the real word is a stigma, and, you know, people recoil from that, but it's actually what is, in, in the case, I think, of, um, to some degree, both divorce and unwed parenthood, which are the two twin mm -hmm. engines driving the family breakup phenomenon, um, more, uh, more judgment, more of a sense of um, this is not a good thing. Well, I, in your judgment, uh, to generate, uh, or rather regenerate that ethos, is it um, is it uh, important to stress only the empirical point, or is there a moral <coughs> dimension that can still be vitalized? Now, as if you could say, look, he here is solid proof that um, children born out of wedlock are going to suffer, uh, uh, and the whole society is, is going to suffer directly. For that reason, don't do X. or. Uh, are you also oriented towards the possibility of saying don't do X because doing uh, X uh, is not right? Well, it's a very hard thing. It's something that, that uh, I struggle with a lot in my work. Because of the nature of what my institute does, we are trying to make an argument to, I think, what might be called the sort of elite uh, uh, discourse. We're, that's where we're trying to be heard. And so we use social science and we use, I, I'll say I use social science evidence and uh, try to, you know, you've heard the old joke if you, uh, 200 years ago if you wanted to make a point, quote the Bible, 100 years ago if you wanted to make a point, quote a great work of literature, and today if you want to make a great point, quote a poll or a social science mm -hmm. study. So it's at least open to question whether or not that represents progress in terms of being able to make a strong argument. But that's the playing field that's out there in the elite debate. But uh, I also think that it's necessary at the same time to be clear as we can about the, um, the, the sort of uh, normative framework that we're operating from. For example, um, in a, a book I'm working on now on fatherhood, we have a chapter on the evolution of fatherhood using uh, biological and anthropological evidence. And the next part of it will be a look at fatherhood in the book of Genesis, uh, The Odyssey, Huckleberry Finn, and Two or Three Fairy Tales. That is sort of folk wisdom and... Huckleberry Finn is not a very good uh, well, recommendation. Um, well, he, uh, it was a, it's an example of a, what I guess would be called a dysfunctional family. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, um, and it's interesting that the the, you know, the, the, the the point is to revibrate uh, re that literature to, to show it's continuing uh, relevance. The point is that the your conclusion after you evaluate the anthropological and biological evidence about what is a father, and your conclusion if you evaluate these great texts, are synonymous. Thank you, Mr. Blankenhorn, from the American Values Institute, and uh, we have with us today. 85% of the membership of the Republican Club of Harvard and Radcliffe. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Next week on Firing Line, Shelby White, author of What Every Woman Should Know About Her Husband's Money, 
and law professor Mary Moores Winnig try to convince host William F. Buckley Jr. that community property laws are the only fair way to go because they give access to money to both parties during the marriage. firing line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Annenberg Foundation, the Laurel Foundation, and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449. The local broadcast of Firing Line is underwritten by Mitsui Fidosan, New York, a developer and owner of commercial property dedicated to bringing together the best of New York. Why not invest some money, build a house, see a movie, or go dancing Friday nights with WNYC TV? At 8, Adam Smith helps you put the economy in perspective with sound investment strategies. At 8.30, keep your eye on dance with the choreographers and performers who are on the cutting edge in the world of dance. Then at 9, join Steve and Norm as they take you through this old house. Followed at 9.30 by Home Time, the place where no home improvement is too big. At 10, film critics Jeffrey Lyons and Michael Medved give their picks on sneak previews. Friday Night How To on WNYC TV. It's a tradition. I'm Sarita Chowdhury. Please join me Thursday evening for the Human Rights Film Festival on WNYC TV. Our first program is from England. It is the story of one woman's reaction to war in the Gulf. She horrifies her village by deciding to leave her family and travel to the war zone, joining a peace group. Next, results of war on the small Kurdish village in northern Iraq, attacked by Saddam Hussein's forces in 1983, long before the Gulf War. What did you do in the war, Mom? and Kush Tapa, tomorrow beginning at 8 p.m. For WNYC TV News, I'm Sonny Mandel reporting. Facing charges that his South Bronx address was a sham, third ranking member of the New York City Council, Rafael Castanera Colon, resigns and faces a Bronx DA investigation. In announcing the resignation and investigation, Council Speaker Peter Vallone said that by the DA's request, the Ethics Committee will defer its probe and that while all elected officials should live in their district, by virtue of a 1991 federal redistricting ruling, the residency requirement was lifted for the current two-year term and that just living in New York City is enough. First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton is not the only one dealing with the thorny issue of health care. At a hearing in Lower Manhattan today, the State Insurance Department heard from both the subscribers and a local health care provider on the pros and cons of a rate hike. Now this is the first time that I have been testifying at a rate increase hearing. And I come here today, as do several of the other board members, because we are at a critical crossroad, an HIP, hopefully armed with the rate increase that we are requesting today, is fully prepared to be at the forefront of providing what all the health care reformers are now in search of, quality health care which is affordable and accessible and which has been a part of our core mission for the last 50 years. 
The increase in HIP's rates that are at issue today reflects HIP's needs for essential investments in staff, operations, facilities, and systems in order to maintain and improve services to HIP members. The additional funds that are required for these purposes are the result of conscious decisions by the Board of Directors to support HIP management and HIP's affiliated medical groups in the development of far-reaching efforts to bring about positive and significant change in HIP's healthcare delivery system. Now, the Board has been involved in these initiatives from the start. We have supported these changes because we believe them to be necessary to fulfill HIP's mission and its continuing role, which is also now part of our mission, as a leader in the provision of comprehensive health care services. Over two years ago, we began to discuss the need for a comprehensive planning pro process to guide the development of HIP over the coming years. I think the buzzword at that point was strategic planning. Now the key to this process, at least in our view, was the broad involvement of everyone involved in the service delivery and policy, ma and policy making in the HIP system. That meant HIP senior management, the medical groups, HIPs, obviously HIP's affiliates, staff from all levels of the organization, and the board of directors. The result, after extensive deliberation, was the adoption by the board of a strategic planning document that did many things. It assessed our strengths and weaknesses, it identified our opportunities and problems, and it established a clear sense of direction for HIP's future. Finally, it adopted an extensive set of detailed, palpable, and measurable goals. Among the many current initiatives that are of particular importance to our members is the installation of a new management information system that will automate many essential aspects of HIP's operations and lead to this greater efficiency and effectiveness and quality of care. The QCARE system, as we've been calling it, the adoption of an automated system for processing members' claims, for maintaining enrollment and billing data, and performing a large number of other functions will make the information needed to operate and manage HIP more readily available. For example, the initiation of medical group automated appointment systems, which, as Mr. Watson said, is now installed in all our centers and fully operational in at least 42 of our medical centers. That was as of March and maybe more as of now is already facilitating more rapid and convenient access to care for our members. And I need not remind anyone who's sitting in the room that the issue of automated appointment systems has been something that we have been looking at for years and we have finally gotten it done. Another example is the proposed major expansion of staff in the Medical <laughs> Services Department extended service hours and enhanced computer capabilities which will enable more rapid and accurate response to the hundreds of thousands of telephone inquiries that are received through HIP Talk each year. We talk about it in terms of HIP Talk, which is our centralized system for responding to members' inquiries and questions. Obviously, we have wanted to do something about this for years. We have taken a bold initiative in this area, and that's what part of this rate increase is about. Obviously, there is a financial cost to these improvements. The time required to implement them and incorporate them into HIP's complex and decentralized system is substantial. The board has strongly supported and encouraged management's decision to make these necessary improvements in terms of automation and HIP talk in order to position HIP to continue to provide quality service to our members and achieve ongoing operation efficiencies. The enormous effort that HIP and its medical group management are making to address service issues has given the HIP member council many opportunities to make recommendations at a time when planned improvements are under active consideration. In making its recommendations, the council studies issues thoroughly, including the cost factors involved in its proposals. Examples of the direct involvement of the council in recommending service improvements that are now being planned and implemented on a pilot basis include welcoming calls for new members, the creation of center-specific brochures to provide detailed information on services and medical center hours of operation, 
the use of audio cassettes for the orientation of new members, and the deployment of member services representatives to the medical centers. This will give members more convenient access to information and assistance in resolving their problems. In addition, task forces of the council have been active in discussions to seek improvements in HIP talk, as well as approaches to curtailing inappropriate use of hospital emergency services. Moreover, the council has been kept abreast of the many initiatives being taken to improve claim processing, automated appointment scheduling, and measures to promote healthy lifestyles and preventive care. These projects, as well as other initiatives recommended by the Council, will require an additional investment of resources by HIP. In every instance, the members of the Council have been aware that there will be costs for the measures that they are considering. The decision to urge the enactment of these programs represents a statement by the Council that these programs are necessary and that HIP should make the funds available to carry them out. The same is true of a number of key issues that the Council included in its work program for 1993. The work program, for example, has identified important needs for, self, for staff training and for, the expanding, and for expanding the operational hours at the medical centers themselves. This will provide greater access as well as convenience for the members who find it difficult to obtain care during normal business hours. The Council will be developing recommendations on these two proposals. Its members are aware that the course of these proposals may be significant. While the Council has been careful and selective in its recommendations to management, it has consistently supported the need for initiatives to address key service issues. Having commented upon the Member Council's role in improving services for our members, I would like to take a moment to state my personal views. I am firmly committed to HIP as a source of my health care. I strongly support the goals of the strategic plan and the impressive array of measures that HIP has taken to maintain affordable, quality health care. I consider HIP to be the leading managed care organization in New York State. Finally, I share with my members, my fellow members of the Board of Directors, the belief that the best interests of HIP members will be served by the investment that HIP is making. Investments in new and improved management systems, investments in personal, personnel training and development, investments in commuter ca capability, and most importantly, investments in a wide range of programs that will in every direct way enhance and improve the quality of service to our members. I am pleased by the progress that HIP has, has and is making on a, member, a number of fronts. Its decision to keep pace with the growing needs of its membership is truly paying off for the many members in need of additional services. The addition of mental health as a basic benefit meets an important need and should be available as part of one's health coverage. The members of my union welcome this additional benefit. While maintaining its dedication to not only affordable quality health care, but access to health care for all populations of our society, HIP has embarked upon a wide, a system-wide changes and enhancements to better, to better provide service to its current membership. HIP's request for a rate increase is a modest one considering the magnitude and importance of plan improvements. Everyone is mindful of rising health care costs, but HIP's request is one which represents a balanced effort to reasonably hold the line while making the necessary improvements in its operations and delivery systems. On a personal note, <clears throat> I would like to say that I have witnessed it firsthand the changes occurring in HIP, my own personal medical care and that of my, my mother especially. Um, my mother's very sick, spent years, the last three years under HIP, hasn't cost her one cent. She was considered a person that was dying. And the medical care and then the follow-up care has changed her life and mine. The courtesy and concern is what the important thing to me, and the genuine change in the attitude towards members, my mother, Myself, just the assistance in keeping their care and personal and good care. That's why I highly recommend that you take this rate in increase into consideration and to be granted. It's necessary for all the people of New York City and the members of HIP. Thank you. HIP and its request for a 13.9% rate increase states that it is facing many competing demands for its resources. However, 
all large institutions are facing the same problem. Those in the private and the public sector, as well as those in the not-for-profit sector. New York City's budget is also facing many competing demands with limited resources. Each dollar that goes towards health insurance is a dollar less for other budgetary items, such as increased public health and social services, education,